choose. And why take our word for it? We're the Sony Gold Radio Academy best small station in the Southwest. BCFM 93.2, your official 2015 election station. It's Friday, it's five o'clock. Welcome to BCFM's General Election Politics Show. I'm Tony Gosling. This week we spend two hours until seven o'clock with parliamentary candidates from four of the five main parties, Labour, Lib Dem, Greens and UKIP. I'll be asking some of the questions gleaned from our political reporting, such as 9-11 and secret societies, which you're less likely to hear asked in the mainstream media, and also giving all today's participants a chance to explain their party's vision for the country. I say four of the five main parties because although they were given almost two months' notice, the Conservatives have failed to put forward any of the city's parliamentary candidates for today's discussion. Bristol and South Gloucestershire Conservative Office at Westfield Park explained they're all at a pub politics event in Bristol North West with Conservative candidate Charlotte Leslie tonight. Three weeks ago we had a similar situation on Friday the 9th of April. Both Conservative and UKIP councillors were invited to discuss that week's news, but only UKIP put a councillor forward. I'm disappointed because this is the first campaign in this show's six years of local and general election coverage that any of the city's five main parties have left us with an empty chair. And in the campaign... We've twice lacked a Conservative voice. However, that's their choice. Uh, alongside Conservative Labour, Lib Dem, Green and UKIP, Bristol has former Merchant Venture Mayor George Ferguson, of course, who describes himself as an independent. He's up for re-election next year, as well as several independents for Bristol candidates in next week's ballot, as well as Trade Union and Socialist Coalition, Left Unity, English Democrats, British National Party and Vapours in Power who are campaigning for e-cigarettes too. Some are standing in the BCFM area, but outside the Bristol city boundary. On to our election discussions in a minute, but first, Bristol's two-weekend weather forecast from theweatheroutlook.com. Tonight, lows of 7 Celsius, mostly dry, with some light rain. This weekend, highs of 16 Celsius, cooler and wet and windy. On Saturday, scattered showers, windy but more sunny spells on Sunday. Highs of 16 degrees Celsius through most of next week. A mainly cloudy week with plenty of showers. Next weekend, 9th and 10th of May, highs of 18 degrees Celsius, sunshine and showers. That was Bristol's two-weekend weather forecast from theweatheroutlook.com. So around the table we have representatives of the four of the five main parties standing here in next Thursday's general election. Conservative Party have not put anyone forward for tonight's discussion. Uh, for Labour, sitting MP in Bristol East, it's Kerry McCarthy standing again. And standing for the Liberal Democrats in Bristol South is Mark Wright. Green Party candidate in Bristol North West is Justin Quinnell. And finally, standing in Bristol South for UK Independence Party, it's the chairman of Bristol UKIP, Steve Wood. Hi, all of you. Welcome to the Politics Show. Hi, Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'll start with you, Kerry. Uh, why should we vote for you? What's your party's vision for Britain? Well, I think it's, it's something that's actually very relevant to the part of Bristol where BCFM's offices are located or studios located in that you know, we think that we need a rebalancing of the economy. So it's not about just the rich reaping the rewards and then expecting that to somehow trickle down to the poorer people. This government has hit the... Um, most vulnerable, the, the poorest sections of our community, the hardest, um, with things like the bedroom tax. Ed Miliband was in Bristol this morning, once again reaffirming that it would be one of the first acts of a Labour government would be to repeal the bedroom tax, um, as well as other measures like um, raising the minimum wage, pushing towards a living wage, rewarding employers that would do so. And it's really about, it's a, it's about that. You know, there will be ways of making the rich pay their fair share, so abolishing the non-DOM rule, introducing a mansion tax on homes that are worth more than £2 million, pounds, reinstating the 50p rate of tax. And, and it's all about making sure... You, we see in Bristol there are areas of the city that are very affluent, um, people doing very well and can perhaps you know, have the luxury of... Um, getting by quite nicely no matter who is in government but we see whole swathes of people that are really suffering and our public services too we've said that we would repeal the privatisation of the NHS and that would be another one of the first things that we would do. One of your main things there is the bedroom tax. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people say well this bedroom tax effectively is something that people in private accommodation can't have anyway so why should people in social housing have it? Well, I think the difference is, is when it applies to people in private accommodation it's that the housing benefits set according to what their need is likely to be and the homes that they then go looking for. What you see is in um, 
social housing is people who've actually been in that property for a very long time and it's quite cheap housing you know i've had people come to me affected by the bedroom tax who are they rent 65 pound a week and then they suddenly get asked to pay 13 pound a week towards that they don't have that 13 pound because they're on very restricted incomes these were people that were approaching pension age and had disabilities if you push them into the private sector you are not going to get something for 65 pound a week in the private sector you're going to be paying well over double that, I would say, for a bungalow. So it just doesn't make sense at all to... Put, and there, there aren't the one-bedroom properties available. These were people that had an adult disabled son who needed to come and stay with... He was in residential care, but they wanted him to stay with him them during various periods during the year, which is, you know, entirely normal for a family to want to have that spare bedroom for him to be able to stay there um so it's, it's completely cruel um and it's it's silly policy as well because as i said it ends up costing the council far more if they've got to pay housing benefit for people to go into the private sector okay mark Wright, you're standing for the lib dems in, in bristol mm. south um what's your uh, particular pitch why should we vote for you okay thanks tony I would uh, say there are real, three real reasons why I would um, ask people to vote for me. The first is um, I believe in a fairness agenda. I think uh, in this country we're still asking too much from the people who don't have very much and we're still not asking enough from the people who have quite a lot. And I would agree with a fair amount of some of the things that Kerry said when she was talking about rebalancing the economy. Um, the second, though, is I think um, Lib Dems have a, a policy of uh, changing the economy in a way which is responsible, and that means balancing the needs to um, to, to bring uh, get the deficit under control now, and the, with the responsibility of not simply kicking a huge debt uh, bundle down to our children to deal with. You know, the, the, our, our current generation has made some mistakes, and we've lived beyond our means, and it's up to us really to put that back in order, rather than just booting the the, uh, the problem down the road with the next generation and the final um, prong of my uh, of my um, pitch if you like is that we, we also believe in doing this inside a framework of environmental responsibility so we are strongly in favor of um, promoting renewable energy of um, cutting carbon dioxide emissions and of restructuring both the way we live and our economy so that we can um, pr live in a in a sustainable way uh, in the future generations uh, one of the main questions for the Liberal Democrats is bound to be in many people's minds, what have you actually achieved by being in coalition for the Conservatives? Mm. I think people want to see um, you know, something concrete because one of the main pitches before the last election, of course, was uh, about uh, getting rid of tuition fees. And, mm. of course, the opposite happened, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Um, our policy was to uh, to scrap tuition fees if we could. Uh, we didn't win an overall majority. Uh, neither the Labour nor the uh, Conservative parties were interested in scrapping tuition fees. So we weren't able to fulfil that. And I'm sorry, along, uh, Nick Clegg is sorry. Uh, pretty much everybody in the Lib Dems is very sorry about that, I can assure you. We've taken enough kicking for it. Um, but we did the next best thing, which was to implement a, a tuition fee system, which is effectively a graduate tax. So uh, what are you most proud of that you've got out of the Coalition yeah, I think that wouldn't have happened if the one, Conservatives had been on their own. Yeah, I, I'll mention a few things then. One of the, th the first things I'm very proud of is the is the change in the way we tax income. We've dramatically increased the income tax allowance in a way which reduces the burden substantially on poorer people, and we've recovered that money by bringing in various capital gains taxes and other tax tweaks, which are quite complex, but which recover that from people who are much more wealthy. I'm very pleased about that because that's align that's aligning with my fairness agenda that I mentioned earlier. Another thing I'm very proud of is the fact that we've, we've tripled the amount of renewable energy that's generated in this country over just five years. That's the single biggest increase in the amount of renewable energy generated in this country in history. And that is quite remarkable because, you know, the, the Conservatives, and I need to be perfectly honest, no, they're not here to defend themselves this afternoon, and that's fine, but they, they kicked and screamed and resisted all of the environmental measures we were trying to push through this government. We recently had an open letter written to the media by 20 leading renewable energy uh, companies uh, calling for the Lib Dems to be part of any future uh, coalition because they were, they were so pleased with the amount that's been done on renewable okay, energy. Okay, Mark. Uh, Green Party candidate in Bristol North West is Justin Quinnell. Justin, why should we vote for the Green Party? Why should we vote for you? We sort of sit in this space, this essential space, which is between social justice and environmental sustainability. It's where both of those mix, and we have a long-term vision. We're actually looking far ahead. I mean, the, going through the austerity and stuff, we believe equality 
is more important than growth. And that's how it differs from the other, the other parties, the idea of growth and stuff, the idea that somehow you can sort of grow your way into wealth and things like that. The Earth's resources are finite, and that's a pretty obvious thing, but it's one of the things that is ignored when it comes to, let's say, perpetuating the growth sort of approach that everyone else has got. We're currently using, in the UK, about four times the amount of planet uh, each person. If the whole world used that amount, then the we'd need four, like, three extra planets and stuff. It can't carry on that way. So what we're doing is basically sort of thinking to ourselves, right, how can we evolve things for a low-carbon future? How can we evolve it so we actually get a bit more equality in, in society and stuff? So we would obviously not cut any more welfare and stuff and actually sort of invest in jobs, in ecologically sustainable jobs and in environmentally friendly jobs to actually sort of, like, get, our, get the workforce working towards a sustainable future and stuff. So, Justin, you, are you pleased about the announcement this week that the UK economy might be weaker than the Eurozone for the first time in four years? You seem to be imp implying, and maybe there's some truth to it, that actually mm. growth is not good. We've had figures this week saying that... Uh, uh, the opposite is happening with regards to the 2010 general election, where uh, growth seemed to be picking up at the tail end of the last Labour government. Mm. What's happening now is the opposite. Mm. Growth is now going down at the tail end of the previous coalition, Conservative Lib Dem coalition. It depends how you're measuring growth. Right now we measure growth as you know, things that are sort of like disastrous and stuff, the amount of sort of fuel and stuff, the amount of rubbish we create and stuff. There's loads of things which we include in GDP which are actually very destructive both to environment and to society. We have to sort of reassess how we measure success in our economy, not just simply growth at all costs. I was down in Falmouth last week, of all things, and there were ships outside. You can see them. What they're doing is dumping all their old sort of dirty diesel and getting new diesel before they get into the waters of the UK and stuff. And, you know, that is all part of, let's say, the growth thing. The growth thing, if you just do not look at the actual damage that a lot of it has done and do not include that within your sort of, like, the way you measure success, you're, you're going to end up with, a, you know, rather like this morning, look at the M32 chock-a-block and just knowing what it's like in, in, in Beijing and places like that. We're going the same way. OK. Standing in Bristol South for the UK Independence Party, Chairman of Bristol... UKIP, Steve Wood, what, why should we vote for you? What's your party's vision? Well, we believe that the UK has been let down by the three main parties in the last 40 years. We believe that the UK is good enough to govern itself, ourselves. Uh, we don't need to be governed from an outside source, such as Brussels. 75% of our laws are currently made in Brussels, when we believe that no law should be made in an overseas land that occur, uh, sorry, that will reflect on us. We believe we be sh should be making our own laws. So in particular, South Bristol has been let down des desperately. It, up until about three years ago, it had a high unemployment, high drug rate, and uh, I'm pleased to say that is actually being brought down. Um, great uh, incentives are happening over in uh, South Bristol. However, it's still not getting the government funding it needs, and I believe that we need to bring in certain areas of the private sector that will help train our young, retrain the unemployed, and get people back to work. Um, in relation to the uh, benefits uh, system, we believe that uh, distress can happen to anybody at any time, um, and we would continue to fund the benefit system as it is. We would protect it from benefit fraud across the board, uh, and we would cut down on benefit tourism as well. We would include a five-year embargo on benefits for anybody coming into the country to, uh, to stay here permanently or to get a, uh, a visa. We believe that if you're coming to a country as a visitor or as um, somebody to stay here, that you should have health insurance. We have paid into the system. People coming here have not. David Cameron for the Conservatives um, is he's pitching for uh, we will have an in-out referendum, so why aren't you voting Conservative? Because you cannot have an in-out referendum after January 2017. Uh, it's going to be physically impossible and then you blame the EU. We already have QMV that we can't do anything without the other 28 uh, majority. What does that mean, QMV? Quality majority voting. And uh, if we don't have consent of the, all the other countries, they're all 28, we're not going to be able to withdraw fully. There are two ways that we would like to withdraw, and that's an amicable divorce uh, for two years, and we have two years on entanglement. If the European Union decide they don't want to go down that road, we repeal the Maastricht Treaty, and we just leave. 
Uh, let's start on this Europe issue, um, because I'd like to hear from everybody about it. Um, what, what are your thoughts, um, uh, Justin, maybe you first, on, on this issue that, that Steve's brought up there, <clears throat> about whether it's actually going to be bad or good for Britain if there is a vote and we do decide to pull out of Europe? I think there's quite a lot of people in other parts of Europe that are thinking similar things, particularly the Greeks are thinking about pulling mm. out of the Eurozone, you know, the currency zone, and there's a, a little bit of a wave of um, at least people thinking about seceding from Brussels. Mm. Uh, well, we do, I think, need to have a vote on whether we stay in or come out of the EU. We do need to. Um, there's big problems with the EU. It's, uh, you know, the Commission's completely undemocratic, um, and that's wrong. You know, we need to be able to sort of, let's say, I mean, as, as Green Party and stuff, we would like to change the EU to stay with, let's say, the good sides of it. I think all of us want to keep the good bits and get rid of the bad bits. That's one of the awkward things. But can Britain survive on its own outside the EU, or is it to now so totally dependent economically on the other uh, part, we need to, part of the structure? Uh, we, we need to be able to great, build smaller societies. If you're trying the globalisation idea, the idea that everyone's going to sort of grow more and more and be more involved with everyone else, well, we've got that sort of like, you know, web-based stuff and all the rest. So when it comes to being able to create sustainable societies and sustainable communities, um, we need to look inwards more. We need to make sort of smaller areas more democratic, more independent, rather than looking at big mega states and stuff and then involving, let's say, America into big trade deals as well. I don't think we need to have this idea of like, it being one particular big mega block that we have to rely upon. Mark Wright, if there was a vote, which way would you vote? I would vote to stay in, absolutely. I think if we left the European Union, it would be a disaster for the economy of this country. The overwhelming majority of all of our trade is with Europe and will always be with Europe because they're, they're right on our doorstep. And the way we get involved with uh, you know, uh, managing and uh, determining the, the trade regulations that, uh, that, that are involved with all that uh, and all the rules that go on is by being inside the EU. Um, I'm absolutely in favour of reforming the EU. There's a lot that needs reforming in there. You mentioned the, the, uh, you know, the, the Council of Ministers, which is clearly a, a fairly undemocratic setup at the moment. There's a lot that needs to be reformed. But leaving, leaving the European Union would be a disaster, I think. And we've already got a situation now, so it's law, that if um, any powers are ceded to Europe, there has to be a referendum on that particular item. And I think that's a good thing, because I think you know, we, have, we have ceded some powers to Europe, which were probably unnecessary, and um, you know, the the European Union is doing what all powerful bodies do, which is starting to meddle in things that it shouldn't be meddling in, you know, and I would like to see a, re a return to the kind of, um, in Europe it's called subsidiarity, but everyone else calls, calls this the principle of federalism, which is that uh, bodies only uh, deal with the things which are best dealt with at that level. Uh, I'd like to see more things probably dealt with at a, a, a national and subnational, you know, local and city level that are that are currently being dealt with too high. For Labour, Kerry McCarthy, w w which way would you vote if there was a vote? Say uh, the UK Independence Par Party got a sweeping majority and decided next week to do uh, a vote on the, whether to stay in or out of the EU. Okay. Um, I would vote to stay in. I think that Britain has gained a lot from its position within the EU and I just think more is to be gained by cooperation and working with other countries particularly when you have you know, China coming to the forefront now and um, America still being a powerhouse. But you can still um, cooperate, can't you? Because, I mean, well, for I, example, Iceland uh, isn't, and um, also Norway and Switzerland, they're not in the EU, but they still they're cooperate. Not in, they're not in the EU, but I don't think they have some... Uh, it's... it's Partly about cooperation to benefit the UK. So as, as Mark said, you know, I think it's 54% of our, our trade is with the EU. The fact that Britain um, has so many international companies based here in the financial sector, for example, is because we are a gateway to Europe and uh, to the European market. So if we're not part of the single market, they would choose to go elsewhere. Europe's also been... Very, you know, in some ways it was our saving grace during the Thatcher years with things like the social chapter in terms of protecting workers' rights and health and safety. And if you look at some of the environmental legislation, the animal welfare legislation, the food safety directive, all that sort of thing came out through the European Union. And as I said, during the Thatcher years when working people were being hammered left, right and centre, it was the one saving grace that we could go to Europe for protection there. So I think a lot is to be gained. I agree that there is also the need for reform. We've, we've said, that, you know, our policy is if there's another treaty proposed which would hand more powers to Brussels, then we would 
have a referendum. But in terms of reform as the situation is now, I mean, the common agricultural policy is the most obvious one. It's given millions of pounds in subsidies to the wealthiest landowners who don't need it. It's propping up a, an uneconomical farming system and it's not actually protecting the natural environment. Okay, Kerry, so that would um, be one thing. Um, Steve Wood, for you, keep your mind to come in there. Yeah, I did. Mark, you said it, and both Kerry said 54% of our trade is with the EU. That's total nonsense. Um, read the Antwerp and Rotterdam effect. Anything that comes into the country or goes out has to stop at Ant Antwerp or uh, uh, Rotterdam. They then have their goods reclassified as coming from or going to the EU. The actual trade with the EU is going down and we need to be looking at trading with the Commonwealth and other countries. Now, we don't need, we don't need to be in a European Union to have a trade agreement. Look at the North American Trade Alliance. You know, those countries actually trade with each other. They have the same sort of thing that we wanted, which was what we were told as a lie, to be a free trade agreement. They're all in the North American Trade Alliance, and yet they're not in a political union. You do not need to be in a political union to try and trade with each other. And one final point, Kerry, you're saying about everything that happened, not only during the Thatcher years, but during the years um, after that, where the European made rules and regulations. Are you saying that as a UK, we are incapable of making our own rules and regulations to protect people, that the British people don't have that well, capacity? That? Yeah, but what I'm saying is we, we live in a global economy. If we wanted to introduce better working conditions, if we wanted to introduce things like the, the minimum wage, if we want to protect working people in this country, it is helpful if we then negotiate and try to deal with these things on block with other European Union countries. I mean, Ed Miliband has said that one of the things he wants to tackle if we're elected next week is to make sure that employers here can't exploit workers from the EU accession countries by somehow getting around the minimum wage legislation and paying them less, which would undercut the terms and conditions and the wages of British workers. It seems to me eminently sensible that you work with your closest allies, your, your neighbouring countries, to make sure that they lift everyone up the, off the bottom, so it's not a race to the bottom in terms of, of workers. OK, we're going to draw a line... Hang on. We're going to draw a line under the EU there, because we've had quite a lot of discussion about it. I want to move on to something which you won't hear on the BBC and, and other places like that. And I'm going to refer to the 2008 bank bailouts, because we often hear about these talked about as the crash. Of course, it wasn't a crash. It was a bailout with our money. Those banks didn't collapse. We got, they got a lot of money from the public purse to keep going, nearly $750 billion, in fact. Uh, now, uh, nearly half a million people live in Bristol. I mean, that's 450,000. It's about the same population as Iceland, which I mentioned earlier on. The Icelandic government have arrested and jailed several top bankers for fraud. They've cancelled what they say are fraudulent debts, which those bankers run up. And Iceland's economy is now recovering strongly. If we weren't tied to Westminster, could Bristol and should Bristol have done the same? I think I'll start with you, Justin Quinnell, from the Green Party. Well, that sounds good. Yeah, um, I quite like the idea of that. Um, I'll it, also, it, also mention that there was a big inquiry into post the, uh, the, the, the uh, bailout by Andrew Tyree, Conservative MP, uh, the uh, Commons, I think is it fi Finance Select Committee, Economic Select Committee, Treasury Select Committee, and he decided uh, three, you know, two and a half years ago that they were going to split retail banking and casino banking, and that simply hasn't happened. So, anyway, Justin. It's interesting you mentioned the word casino, because the whole thing's based on gambling anyway, it seems to be, the sort of like betting on money and stuff and trying to sort of uh, you know, keep that going. I remember the ice save thing, when that was sort of like more and more percentages and everybody was diving into it. That relates to Iceland as well. Um, no, we, we probably could. I think that if you want to try and get sort of like, um, you know, hand power back to local communities and stuff, you could probably hand the economic power back to local communities as well. Um, and, uh, you know, Bristol may well do quite well with that. But when it comes to sort of the bankers and stuff, yeah, they are the people who are guilty. They're the people who went and sort of like got the money and basically now everyone's suffering from it. The austerity is like, you know, making huh, the fifth is it the fifth wealthiest nation in the world I think the UK is, or supposedly and we've got this sort of like poverty everywhere I've got this thing here, more than one in four children growing up in poverty and stuff and austerity and cuts are still being mentioned and they're still the sort of little bribe for voting for specific parties and yeah, this election. Everybody's being told there's not enough money but we're the sixth you, richest country in the world. And, and you, could, you could, I mean you know, it's 
not that much money as well. No, let's just basically think to ourselves what it was like after the war. There was sort of like billions of pounds to sort of rebuild and stuff. And well, like- it's interesting you mention that, Justin, because the uh, previous head of the Bank of England, I call him, always call him King Mervyn, Mervyn King, mm. he said that the uh, 2008 collapse had had an effect on the British economy like a world war, like we'd fought a world war. Anyway, Kerry, what, what do you make of what's happened to the banks and the failure, really, to uh, separate these two types of banking? That is, the casino banking, which is largely investment banking and speculation from the money that we save and that we put in the high street yeah. banks. Well, I think there is an issue, and certainly the sort of thing that Alistair Darling was looking at and um, we've conducted reviews on in opposition. Um, the Andrew Tyree's chair of the Treasury Select Committee, they can only make recommendations and it would have been for the Conservative government to take measures forward. So that's why nothing's happened on that. And um, yet yeah, in America you had the Glass-Steagall Act, which separated investment banking from retail banking. And that general concept that no bank should be too big to fail, which is what happened then. I mean, the reason, you yeah, know, we had no choice but to bail out the banks, because if we hadn't, it would have been ordinary people. We already started to see queues outside Northern Rock, people trying to re- withdraw their savings. So it wasn't that we wanted to do the, the bankers a favour and rescue them. It was about rescuing people whose life savings and the very livelihoods were tied up in the financial system. But at the end of what the day, we want to it's... make sure is that, that we have a system where that we don't reach that crisis point again. And I, I was a member of the Treasury Select Committee, and I remember um, uh, Eddie George and Mervyn, you know, the, the, the people who were running the Financial Services Authority, coming in front of the committee, and me questioning them about they really understood the risks within the banking system, and particularly some of these financial products, the derivatives, and so on. And they gave quite complacent answers, and they they almost thought that I was asking the question because I didn't understand how the markets work, whereas I do entirely understand how derivatives work. And um, I think there was, there was real complacency. So obviously we need a system of regulation where that can't happen again, and that would inc- include separating out banks' different functions, if need be, to, to ensure that they're not so closely intertwined. Okay. What about one of the major problems that caused it, Kerry, and that is the uh, failure to have proper sets of books made up on the banks, because what was happening was giant black holes were appearing in these banks' um, sets of accounts, and yet the auditors weren't picking up on it. Yeah, well, that was the. I, I worked in banking quite a long time ago. I was a lawyer, um, but um, it was one of those things that you saw then. You had the traders who were at the cutting edge of, of what was going on, and you, you saw it with um, Bearing Brothers when that went under. And I was actually called in to help try and sort out the mess afterwards, looking at all the contracts to see who owed who money. And it was clear then that the management of the banks didn't understand what the traders were up to, and so they were several light years behind the traders and then the bankers, the regulators, the Bank of England at the time, were like even further behind in so, terms of not grasping so was there just an what aspect was going on. So where that, the management and the board of these banks was saying, well, well actually we don't care how you make the money so long yeah, as you yeah, make exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. It was all about um, yeah, the bottom line and so long as Nick Leeson, was, you know, who was the main, the, the trader that caused the bearings crash, so, what will so long Labor, as he was bringing what, in big profits for them, they didn't really care how So what will Labour do if we vote for you to, to do something about the bankers? Well, that, that's the thing. I mean, one of the things that we have said is we will um, introduce a banker's bonus tax again. We tried to, It was the UK government that was lobbying in Brussels for there not to be a cap on bankers' bonuses. Um, I'm, I think it was that... Uh, we were arguing that they shouldn't be allowed to have a bonus that was bigger than their income or twice the size of their income, which is still a huge amount of money. But imagine if your incentive when you go into work is to get a really healthy-looking bottom line at the end of the day so you get a massive bonus. You are going to take risks. You are going to cut corners. You are sometimes going to veer into illegality. So we we want to curb bankers' bonuses because we think that's something that really encourages that risk culture. Are you going to stick them in jail? Well, that's obviously for the courts to decide rather than politicians. I'm sure you wouldn't want a system, Tony, where politicians could just bang people up without justice being done. But I think that there's been an issue well, you know, in the public past. Prosecutions well, might I was, was going to say, in the past, there's been a real issue, um, you know, going back to the days of the Serious Fraud Office, was actually really poor at bringing prosecutions. It didn't bring very many Still at all. Is. And then in most cases, you know, Ernest Saunders, everyone remember him? Um, and his, his yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I think there's a lot to be said. You know, one of the problems is these so-called white-collar crime trials are incredibly expensive, um, go on for a very long time, and juries find it quite, you know, well, you would judges, want to give up a year of your life to sit The judges say the jury, them, so, yeah. it's too complicated for the jury, and then they get rid of it. Anyway, yeah. uh, Steve Wood for the UK Independence Party. What do we do about the bankers and the banking sector? There's no denying that 
we had to bail out the banks. Otherwise, we'd have had a massive problem, probably six times worse than we already had. But, I mean, they're private businesses. Yes, if they, they go bust, surely they should just be allowed to go bust like your business if, would if, if my, you went bust. If I went bust, yeah, nobody and would come and save me. And the shareholders lose their money. Yeah, but what we're, we're not talking about just normal shareholders. We're talking about people's savings. We're talking about their livelihoods. But so, the government guarantees those up to a certain extent. To a certain extent. But there are the wealthiest in the nation who would still lose their money. So the bailout essentially then was for the wealthiest. No, I think the bailouts. I think, I think the bailouts were there for everybody, regardless of who you were. What I would like to see um, is bankers held to account. Let's take the LIBOR rate. When the LIBOR rate came, that it was being falsely inflated. You know, anybody who had a mortgage was subject to that problem, and I think that the people concerned should have been charged. I think they should have been charged with false accounting. What about accounting. the foreign exchange fraud? I think it should all, they should all be charged with fa- what about uh, false PPI accounting. fraud? I mean, it's been a whole succession of frauds that have been caught. And if they're, if they're proved to be fraud, then those people need the weight of the law to come down on them. Nobody in this country, I don't care who you are, whether you're a high court judge or a road sweeper, nobody is above the law. The law of the land is if a fraud is committed, you should be charged. But a lot of people looking at the City of London would say a lot of these blue blood bankers are above the law. Well, I, don't, I disagree with that. Nobody is above the law, regardless of what should colour your blood is. Should be or is above the law? No, n- nobody is above the law. Everybody is subject to the law of the land, no matter how high-born or how so low. So how come the prosecutions happened in Iceland, bankers went to jail, but not here? Because I think people are being protected. That's not a conspiracy theory. I think they're too high up to consider the fact that they are being protected. Too big, by too big to jail? Possibly. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> anyway. I mean, we could argue that, Toss, but I personally think no one is above the law, regardless of the crime. Okay. You commit a crime, you do the time. OK. Uh, um, uh, Mark Wright for the Lib mm, Dems. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, could I say at the start, actually, Vince Cable, the Lib Dem business secretary, was it was quite strongly in favour of splitting the uh, retail and uh, so-called casino banking But you were sectors. there, in the coalition. No, indeed, Why he was there. Happen? Well, unfortunately, the Chancellor, the Chancellor has a say in the matter as well, and he was a Conservative and he wanted none of it. I mean, maybe if there's a Lib Dem Labour coalition in the future, that's something that can be looked at again, because I do think that is an issue. Um, one of the things you, you, you did mention the auditors earlier, and, and there, there was no doubt at all that auditor, the, you know, the big four or whatever they're called, you know, that was a cosy club where it was in none, none of their interests to start rocking the boat. Well, maybe it still is. Yeah, I think, it, yeah, I mean, not enough, not enough has been done on that, to be perfectly honest. Unfortunately, that's a problem that goes beyond Britain as well, because they're, you know, the same big four are active in America as well. Um, and I, I absolutely think there should have been more legal consequences. You know, you mentioned some of these uh, various frauds that we've had. The Forex and the LIBOR ones were absolutely disgraceful. And there were, I mean, there were some pretty big fines handed out to the banks, but those fines actually, in the grand scheme of how much money they were making by perpetrating those frauds, were not really a big deal. You know, I mean, if if, the, if, you, if you steal a thousand quid and the fine for that is a hundred pounds, that's you're not a deterrent. You're going to do it again. That's not a deterrent, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Know, those fines are they're, they're pennies to these people. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I think, think they probably you should have been. Make, I think you should have been to some make more legal consequences. Concerned, for, yeah, absolutely. Uh, accountable. Yeah, absolutely. For you know the directors. I mean, I would be absolutely in favour of that. I mean, the, the Iceland situation is interesting and it, it has some relevance because I'm on the council and of course the council nearly very very nearly got burnt. They had some of its money in the Iceland banks as well. So we were involved with finding out what was going on there. But it was quite a specific situation where it, was, it only really invo- involved two banks and they were perpetrating a very particular fraud which actually turned out to be quite easy to prove and they got clobbered because of that. The problem, the problem in Britain is that there are so many institutions all looking out for each other you know, in, in the way the finance industry works in the city. It's extremely difficult to prove it in the way that it was provable in Iceland. I think if it had been that easy, I'm sure we would have seen it. But, I mean, I think th- there's definitely more that we can do. Um, you know, it, it, in fact, even, even America has been tougher on some of the, the big firms than, than I think Britain has. So, you know, the, the, the IRS in America is actually very aggressive sometimes in going after tax fraud. But, I mean, we're in a worse situation, Mark, with the economy now than we were uh, in 2010. We've roughly doubled the national debt. I mean, there's been all this talk about, oh, we're going to reduce the deficit, but the national debt has been going up and mm-hmm. up and up and up. It's now, I think, is in it £1.5 trillion pounds national debt, all this money owed to the banks. We're never going to pay it off, surely. No, indeed. I mean, 
I, I think everybody knows that the national debt is never going to be paid off. No, no country has ever paid off its national debt. The point, the, well, the I important the, point. I heard the uh, current Prime Minister David Cameron earlier this week saying uh, we are going to pay off the overdraft. Now, uh, that seems to me well, to say, uh, imply nonsense. that he's going yeah. to pay off the national debt. Yeah, I mean, he's talking nonsense. He, 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 I mean, no, nobody thinks that Britain is actually going to pay off one and a half trillion pounds of, of debt. The, the thing which is important is getting down the deficit, which is the rate at which that debt is growing. It's, you know, countries can handle having a national debt of between-ish 50% to 100% of their GDP. If you go above 100% of your GDP, the people you owe the money to start getting very worried, and the rate at which you borrow starts going up and you end up in a situation like Greece. If you're below, you know, if, if you're below 50% of GDP of debt size, then that's absolutely great and, uh, you know, good, good on you. The important thing, I mean, everybody knew in 2010 that the national debt was going to balloon because at that point, when the, when the Labour government uh, w was voted out, the deficit was £160 billion a year. Only five years previous to that, the entire national debt was only about twice that. I mean, we were, we were cranking in extra debt at an astonishing rate. Isn't there a case at some point for a write-down of this debt? Just say, oh, forget it. Um, what, everybody in the world write off their national debt? Well, at least Britain. I mean, that's, we've got some kind of uh, control over it. Kerry, what do you th think? You're talking about Britain putting itself into bankruptcy yes. process. Um, I mean, the thing <laughs> I is, think, I think the people the who we owe the debt to might be... Okay, a we've, we've, we've had a lot of pain over the last five years with austerity. It seems to me almost like all pain, no gain, when we've doubled the national debt virtually during that time. So yeah. how can we carry well, on? Well, I think Surely the, we just say, no, we're not having well, any more of this. No, that doesn't work, Tony. Mm. But um, I think the key thing is that, you know, austerity doesn't work either in that if you... You do, you know, it's basic Keynesian economics that you do not slash the public sector um, when the economy is weak because you need to invest at times like that because if you invest in construction jobs, if you invest in people working in the public services, that keeps people in the private sector in work too and you don't have a welfare bill that's going through the roof. So it's... It was entirely wrong to rush. We, we warned George Osborne that when he said that he, he said he was going to eliminate the deficit within five years. He's only just about, well, he's, he's not quite managed to halve the deficit in those five years, and he's borrowing a huge amount more than he actually planned to do so. So it, that proves that austerity doesn't work. What we've said is we want to try and balance the books. We will try to reduce the deficit year on year, but not this mad rush um, towards doing so at the expense of economic growth. Well, one prosperity. of the things that Iceland has found is by giving more money to poor people, they spend it, whereas mm. if rich people have more money, they don't spend it. Anyway, Justin, your thoughts on the... Uh, uh, on the, the a couple of things, really. I mean, it's just the idea that, let's say, every country in the world has this massive debt, so the whole world's got a massive debt. I'm just wondering, sort of, which planet we actually owe this debt to. You know, is it some sort of, like, you know, somewhere else off the uh, surface we of the earth? Yeah, most of it to the banks, don't we, and yeah. to the IMF. It's all there, and it's all the this sort of hypothetical stuff. But the other thing as well, just a couple of words that sort of, like, I felt the hairs on my back, that my neck going, was this idea of bonuses and it's just the fact that there is so much you know poverty around the place and there's still talk and discussion about this bonuses business um you know the idea that people in companies can earn hundreds and hundreds of times more than other people in that company or whatever it just seems completely and utterly wrong we need to look at a way of being able to sort of share the world world fairly rather than sort of like allow this idea that some people can have a huge amount and some people have nothing. Steve Wood for the UK Independence Party. What are we going to do about this doubling, virtually doubling of national debt over the last five years? Well, you can't borrow your way out of debt. There's no way. If you remember back in the 90s and the early 2000s, there was all these wonderful adverts for going around for borrow more money, pay off all your debt. When you're just increasing your debt, you have to have some form of austerity. And I've said it once and I'll say it again. We talk about billions and billions of pounds being spread around and the average householder doesn't get the figures because it's too many noughts. Let's take it to be like your home accounts. If at the end of the month you don't have enough money left over to pay your bills, you have to cut back. And that means that next month you'll have a little bit more. You don't turn around and say, I'm not going to pay anybody this month, so next month I'll pay double. Well, sometimes, does, sometimes people do, don't they? They say, well, literally, I cannot afford to pay it, and then they have to go to a debt advice service, sometimes go bankrupt. There is that to it. There is that to it. And if people have to go bankrupt, then that's it. But it doesn't wipe off the debt. 
it doesn't actually make it go away. It doesn't make life easier. It just makes it sort of disappear for a while. But if you go bankrupt, you have charging orders put on your property and things like that. But on a and national that, scale, on an international still, scale, if for we example, went, this has happened in Argentina, it's happened in yes, Russia. Yes, but if we went bankrupt, they, the, our loans wouldn't get wiped off it automatically. The lenders would put charges on things and they would expect that to be paid back. When we get into a situation, you must have some form of austerity. But I don't think that the cuts, as severe as they have been, if we do things slowly, if you do things carefully, you can make a lot Kerry, more difference. Kerry, uh, Steve just said that you can't borrow your way out of debt. Sorry. Um, did I suggest that? Well, we, you were suggest you were suggesting that we would be spending more. Uh, there would be possibly be, government would be spending more, and that well, would help what the recovery. What we've said is we wouldn't borrow. Um, to fund current expenditure. There might be a case for borrowing for investment. So in the same way that the last Labour government um, built more schools and hospitals and that infrastructure spending is important. We want to be building, um, well, the aim is to be well on the way to building one million new ho homes um, by 2020. And by 2020, we'll be building 200,000 a year. And those are homes that are really badly needed by people, you know, in Bristol as well as, as elsewhere. So sometimes um, borrowing is the right thing to do. But the key thing is, is to make sure you've got money coming into the coffers. And those things I mentioned earlier, like, like the mansion tax, like raising the uh, top rate of tax to 50p, um, not going ahead with the Tories' plan to cut corporation tax by a penny, um, even if it goes back up to 21p, it will still be the lowest in the G7 by far, way low. I think America is on about 36% at the moment. So measures like that, a, a, a levy on the tobacco companies, and as I said, the, the banker's bonus tax, that brings in money to the coffers. What about and they uncollected spent on, billions of well, pounds of tax? Well, 7.5 billion yeah. of um, tax avoidance, and I've said we'll abolish the non-DOM rule, which should have been done a long time ago, to be fair. We don't, we're not saying that the entire 7.5 billion could be recovered because people, you know, well, it, you know, it's, it's not an easy task to, you can't just sort of straight away put your hand out and the money comes flowing in. But we can, there's certainly a lot of money there that we should be Mark. recovering. Yeah, thank you, Tony. I mean, it's, re it's really interesting, actually, listening to Labour candidates over the election period. Um, I mean, they spent four and a half years railing against cuts and railing against austerity, and then Ed Miliband comes out with their manifesto and, of course, commits the Labour Party to five years more austerity and five years more of, uh, you know, of, of some sm small cuts, not big cuts, but small cuts. Um, and I think, you know, Labour, Labour candidates that are elected are going to have a lot of difficulty explaining why their rhetoric in the last five years and the election campaign doesn't match up with what they're actually planning to do under Ed Miliband. Now, I have to say that the, what Ed Miliband is proposing is actually pretty similar to the, to the Lib Dem plan in terms of getting the deficit under control and the way that that's going to be balanced with tax rises and, um, and spending restraint. And I, I think that's quite good. I, I mean, I'm quite glad that the Labour Party has at least sort of start, started to come to its senses, although, as I so I don't think that they seem to have passed on the message to their candidates okay. at the moment. On, on to a look now at our foreign policy and uh, some of the background to it all. The 9-11 attacks uh, back in 2001 pitted the West's military against the Muslim world in Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Middle East and North Africa, particularly bringing chaos now to Iraq, Syria and Libya. But were the Twin Towers and World Trade Center Building 7 brought down by fires or by explosives in the buildings? So-called controlled demolition. Well, the US architect Richard Gage, who represents 2,300 architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, says it's impossible for fires to bring down those three buildings on September the 11th. Last week, he gave a presentation, quite literally explosive evidence, he called it, to the International Affairs Society at Bristol University, where I caught up with him. You have anti-terrorism laws here in the UK that go all the way back to 9-11, just like ours do in, in the US. Any of us can be arrested, held indefinitely, without a right to a lawyer or a trial. We can be disappeared, basically, even tortured. This is not acceptable. So the MPs have to be educated. They have to know what really happened on 9-11. And we have to break through the denial and the subterfuge that we get from uh, some of our elected representatives. Some of these people actually know what's going on, and they're just lying about it. So the BBC is complicit in covering up the truth about 9-11. In fact, they announced the collapse of World Trade Center 7 20 minutes before it even happened. And they had the reason for the collapse. 
they apologize for this grievous error, citing the confusing events of the day. You pay your license fee to the BBC for fair and balanced and accurate reporting. And we have not gotten it with 9-11. A lot of people will be saying, Richard, this is 14 years ago, a long time ago. Can't you just let it lie? There are wars that were started. Uh, 400 English soldiers have lost their lives, 6,000 U.S. soldiers. There are wars that are continuing as a result of 9-11. If there's any question about what happened back there, and there are hundreds and hundreds of very solid questions with very flimsy or no answers, then we've got to reopen the investigation. We've got to find out exactly what happened to those buildings because that's the easy part. I think, as an architect at least, I can see, and I think anybody can see, that those buildings are blowing up in the case of um, the Twin Towers. In the case of World Trade Center 7, they're imploding. Uh, It's very easy to see once people actually get a chance to look at the evidence, and especially in the presentation like we're giving here tonight at Bristol University. The whole world has changed since 9-11. We're engaged in a police state. We are heading in the wrong direction. We are going to get another 9-11 type attack. If we don't expose the first one, we'll deserve what we get if we allow the truth about 9-11 to be swept under the rug of history. Well, I'm afraid I wasn't there to find out what the uh, Bristol University International Affairs Society made of Richard Gage's presentation. He represents about 2,500 architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. But I'd like to go around the table now, starting with Mark Wright from the Lib Dems, to ask what you think about what really happened on September the 11th. Do you think we need to reinvestigate that and how it's affected our foreign policy ever since? Sure. Um, Well, I'm a scientist, uh, Tony. I have a degree in chemistry and a PhD in astrophysics. I mean, I took quite a detailed interest in some of the stuff that was being um, looked into when they did the investigations. Um, And I know this is a a favourite topic of yours on on this show, but I've got to say... There's absolutely no way I can I can believe that um, the the established story is not correct. I mean, the steel girders that hold up the World Trade Center were originally coated with a flame retardant insulin, which is designed to protect them against fires of the of the kind that they were expecting in a building. Um, steel is of course exceptionally strong material; it can hold up a hundred-story building easily except uh, for when the temperature of that steel goes above 1,000 degrees, because above 1,000 degrees, steel actually becomes quite plastic and can, and can give way quite suddenly. If you've got a, a kitchen, um, for example, where and you've knocked it through to your lounge and you've had a steel girder put above it, um, the, the building regulations these days say that you have to have that, uh, that, that girder coated in some way or other with uh, either some foam or some, uh, some other building materials which protect it against kitchen fires because it's, it's understood that even in the context context of a kitchen fire that if that girder gets above a thousand degrees it could buckle and the walls in your house could fall down and that that is simply what happened in those buildings the force of the plane crash was so huge that it simply blasted off this flame retardant and insulin from the steel girders and that meant that they was exposed to the fire caused by the kerosene from the the planes uh, you know in in the planes fuel tanks and unfortunately after um, you know the exposure for half an hour as it was an, an, I think an, an, an hour for the other building the, the steel simply gave way and they collapsed um, what about the, the, what's happened mm. since because sure, there's been yes. this thing called the war on terror yes indeed it? I mean I I marched against the uh, you know the war in Iraq I think that the reaction of uh, the Americans in, uh, but, uh, and of uh, Tony Blair and the, the Labour government at the time was completely the wrong reaction I mean I understand why they went after Os- Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan and I think that was probably justifiable to then suddenly widen the whole remit to basically include everyone that's ever annoyed America in the last 40 years, which is what it effectively became, was ridiculous and massively, massively counterproductive. It has not only stoked up a load of hornet's nests um, all across the Middle East and Africa and Central Asia, churning out now thousands and thousands of motivated terrorists who are coming and causing us all sorts of trouble, but it also destroyed our international reputation 
of, of the, the Security Council, the British and the Americans in particular, and leads to the situation whereby we've got Vladimir Putin invading effectively and destabilizing his surrounding countries. And then we stand up and we say, look, this is an absolute disgrace. You can't just send your troops into another country. And he says, oh, what? Hold on. What? You mean like you did in Iraq? And we've got nothing to say. We've got nothing to come back on that because we have ruined our reputation. Uh, Justin Quinnell for the Green Party. What are your thoughts about September the 11th itself and the repercussions? Uh, my first thoughts are teaching at University West of England, doing a workshop, having a lovely morning, going out, eating my sandwiches by the deer park, coming back in and all the students had disappeared to a television room and seeing it all happen there and then. Um, that's my first thoughts and uh, knowing the World Trade Centre and doing photographs underneath it and through it and stuff like that and uh, it's, it was somewhere it was, you know, okay, it's uh, epitomised sort of what was probably worse in the world which is World Trade, but it is also an amazing space, the actual environment of being there with this sort of like building a third of the mile up and above you, it's, uh, it's still something I can never forget I used to have a friend who had a flat in Battery Park and we used to sort of uh, stay there which is right below it um, so I've got also I've got to agree, I'd, I, I like a good conspiracy theory, I don't think that's one um, you know, I think that that's the sort of thing that people will come up with which will have a massive effect, as it did. Well, one um, of the things Richard Gage says is, for example, as you can see, the fires are virtually out by the time the building collapses, and also there are steel pr poles, kind of parts of the building, are being projected outwards um, mm. as if with explosives. Yeah, I still think it's the sort of thing people would do. I think that, like, flying planes into buildings is something somebody had the idea of, and they thought, right, we'll do it, and they did. Oh, and okay, what about, so. okay, what about the uh, consequences for yeah, places like I Afghanistan? Think there's a few words here. Um, Tony Blair and George Bush. And just thinking about George Bush right now, and I just, it just, it's almost like thinking about Thatcher and stuff. It just, you think, these, this was serious. Tony Blair and George Bush came up with this idea of almost destabilising the world. You know, just, it, it's absurd. You know, the way their policy was basically in a, a, a very sensitive, sort of very changing world, as I said before, their foreign policy was basically based on lies, ignorance and aggression. And, uh, you know, we haven't got a leg to stand on. It's absolutely hideous. And if you look at also the way that, let's say, you know, we've backed some countries in the Middle East and not others and stuff, you know, it's left us, in a way, evolving in this incredibly sort of changed world, which... Um, you know, how we encounter now and how we encounter the future is stuff we're going to have to just sort of, like, live with. I mean, when it comes to the militarisation side of stuff, though, if we do get a chance of saying sort of a, we shouldn't have Trident, because Trident won't do any use against terrorism. It's not to do with that. Well, people will say, won't they, that uh, the Taliban have beaten a lot, a lot of uh, the uh, forces that went over there with AK-47, so Trident missiles not really going to help. Mm. Kerry McCarthy, what's your thoughts about what really happened on 9-11 mm. and the reaction to it since? Well, I have to say I agree with the others. I don't think that there's much credence to the, the theories that... Um, the visitor to Bristol University was was putting forward. Um, in terms of what happened since, I mean, far more recently, I wasn't in Parliament when um, the vote was taken to go into Iraq. That was um, in 2003, obviously, and I didn't become an MP till 2005. But I was there for the vote on Syria, where actually uh, not just um, David Cameron, but um, also... President Obama at the time, I think, were committed to taking action in Syria. That's the summer, and I the think, summer before last, so yeah, that's 2013. Last, yeah. yeah, and I think that the, you know, and it was Labour that took the lead in saying, actually, this has got some quite disturbing echoes of what happened around the time of Iraq. There wasn't the international consensus that action was needed, and, and above all, there wasn't a clear idea of what intervention would achieve. And I think the difference between Syria and Libya, which was a little bit earlier, um, was that at least we knew then that immediate intervention would stop Gaddafi ma marching on Benghazi, and there was an absolute massacre that was just on the, the cusp of taking place. It but seems Ed like Miliband, the massacre has well, happened anyway. Well, the thing yeah, is, Ed, Ed Miliband make a, made a foreign policy speech last yeah. Friday at Chatham House, where he said exactly that, that it, was, it wasn't what happened in terms of the intervention that caused the problems in Libya. It was the lack of a plan afterwards. It was, you can't just go in and engage in a country and then withdraw and leave them to sort out the aftermath. I mean, why are we and going in, engaging in foreign countries anyway? Well, I, th I think, you know, it's, it's always a, a really difficult call. You're sat there in Parliament, and with the Syria vote, I was very conscious that if I voted for action, people would die, and if I voted against action, people would die. 
and it's a judgment call. I, as I said, I, I felt that it hadn't been properly thought through. There wasn't the international mandate. We didn't know who we would be arming if we armed the opposition, and now you look at ISIS. Well, I mean, and, you ISIS know, are in so, Syria, so yeah. might it be OK to intervene in Syria to stop ISIS? Well, I, I, th I think you have to look at each case. I mean, if you look at, say, Kosovo, for example, you know, or Sierra Leone, there, there are examples where intervention does help and it's the right thing to do um, but you need to look at what you're hoping to achieve and you need to not abandon them to their fate once you've actually sort of you know, gone in and done whatever action, military action you, you were proposing. An, an exit strategy. Well, it's, it's not even just Steve, an exit strategy. It's, it's a plan for helping the them govern the country. I'll to to be as quick as I can, can, Tony. I well, have... 9-11 itself and the consequences. I, I will agree with the rest of the panel. I don't think it's a conspiracy theory. I think that we had uh, an atrocious um, uh, uh, situation created by Tony Blair and George Bush who took us into two wars that were built on a lie. Um, and I personally believe that Tony Blair and George Bush are responsible for ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Uh, they created this situation. They, they've actually destroyed country after country uh, where those countries may have had um, a despot ruler, but they were, to a point, stable. They went in for one good reason, oil, and that's the only reason. We have a country in Africa which the, the uh, people are being starved, where people are being murdered, but there's no oil. That's called Zimbabwe, and we have left that country alone, and Mugabe is one of the biggest mass murderers going. So now, should we intervene in Zimbabwe? No. We shouldn't have intervened in, in Syria, like we shouldn't have intervened in Afghanistan, and we shouldn't have intervened in Iraq. Um, we should have left it and tried to use peaceful means for it. So around the table tonight, we have representatives of four of the five main parties standing here in next Thursday's general election. The Conservative Party have not put anyone forward for tonight's discussion. For Labour, standing again in Bristol East, it's a sitting MP, Kerry McCarthy. For the Liberal Democrats in Bristol South, Mark Wright. Green Party candidate in Bristol North West, it's Justin Quinnell. Finally, standing in Bristol South for the UK Independence Party, it's Chairman of Bristol UKIP, Steve Wood. Uh, and let's start uh, on a question which uh, Kerry McCarthy brought up uh, just as we were listening to the news there, which is legal aid and legal advice. And I want to start with you, Kerry, uh, because we've seen big, big changes, haven't we, in legal aid, which has had a massive effect for many people, for example, trying to claim employment rights uh, since the 2010 election. Yeah. I mean, the, the, one of the... Well, I was going to say one of the worst things that the past government's done, but there is quite a lot of competition. But introducing employment tribunal fees of £1,200 to bring it... So if you wanted to bring a case of racial discrimination, sex discrimination, unfair dismissal, you would have to try and find £1,200 up front to take the case there. And that's without things like legal fees on top of it. Um, and that's obviously a deterrent to people bringing cases. And, um, you yeah, know, it flies in the face of natural justice that people should be prevented from doing that. So we've said that we will repeal those fees. Um, on the wider scale of things, I mean, certainly, you know, I've had lots of discussions with local lawyers about how some of the so-called reforms the government are bringing in, making it much harder for particularly the lawyers in the inner city areas to make a living, because sometimes they deal with clients that actually do require more time and attention. Um, so if you're just giving them fixed fee contracts, for example, where they have to deal with everyone in the same space of time, it's going to be the people that deal with um, customers that need interpretation, for example, that, that struggle. So um, we're looking very closely at how we can... Um, sort of try to reverse some of that. And um, there's also a knock-on impact on things like advice services. We don't have as many of them in Bristol because local government cuts. And I'm certainly seeing more people come to my office who can't get the right legal advice. Uh, now, um, S Steve Wood for Bristol UKIP, you were talking about everyone should be equal under the law earlier on. Well, it seems that if you're poor, sometimes you simply cannot afford to hire a lawyer. You won't be able to afford to. Yeah, that's wrong. Um, you, some of you may not know this, but I work in the legal sector and I, um, I have to deal a lot with domestic violence issues uh, in the sense that I get the documents to serve on the person who's committed the domestic violence. So what do you actually do? I have two companies. I'm a private investigator and a bailiff. And since the legal aid reforms have come in, the Legal Services Commission has cut down on people receiving legal aid in domestic violence, and they have to jump through hoops to get it. 
I have a personal experience of that where we tried to get my daughter legal aid when she had a situation with, with domestic violence. She had to get a letter from her doctor. She had to get a letter from a, a social worker. And it is absolutely wrong. The people who need legal aid need to be able to turn up at a lawyer's office, get an emergency legal aid certificate and get the help they need, especially people who are suffering domestic violence. And let's be honest, whilst the majority of domestic violence is created against women, there are a few men where it gets uh, created against too. I I think the levels are somewhere in the region about 90% against women. And those women need to be able to go to a lawyer, give evidence and get a interim injunction order so that they can protect themselves. This business where they have to jump through hoops, where they have to get a doctor's letter, they have to see a social worker, it's almost like saying, well, I won't help you unless you come to me with a bruise. And we know that domestic violence is not just physical, it's emotional, it's control, and it needs to be stopped. Okay, Uh, Justin Quinnell for the Green Party. There's been big changes to legal aid. It's been withdrawn in many areas. Employment law, sometimes things like in in housing cases, people simply cannot get any legal aid anymore. Yeah, I mean, it used to be that, um, I mean, the law centre down in Stokes Croft, which was an amazing place, um, and, you know, there it was accessible, and it made itself accessible. You just had to either go in, people would see you, you could phone up at certain times, and you'd be listened to, and you would be listened to. There wasn't any worry about sort of let's say being able to afford and a lot of people have lost that and I don't believe they now feel that they have any easy avenues into le- into being able to sort of fight their corner with things um, if you're part of a union and stuff like that then you can sort of like get that back up but if you're just an individual getting sort of like you know getting ripped off by some landlord or sort of let's say some employment sort of case or whatever it is then that it is getting, it is getting incredibly difficult. Um, I have I've experience of the law centre myself. I've known people who've worked there and things, and it was an amazing space. And that's what we need to have in a in a fair society. We need to be able to have law accessible to everybody. Mark, right for Lib Dems, there's been big changes here. Um, wh- wh- why is is there any particular reason why we should have legal aid? Surely, if someone wants a lawyer, they should pay for it. Um, I think well, legal aid obviously is, exists in for the, much of the same reason that you know we have a, a welfare safety net, which is that not everyone has enough money to get themselves a defence in court or to help um, get get an issue resolved that they need to. And that's why legal aid exists. And it, it is a good idea. Absolutely, it has to exist. Of course, there's always, it's always about balance, though, because it's also true that there was huge growth in the legal aid bill um, in, in the previous decade. Um, I think it tripled um, under the Labour Party, and th- there was no way that it could carry on growing as it had done. And likewise, the, the, the amount of tribunals that were being launched was also growing enormously over the years. Um, and tribunals, so for example, which, which in, in this case what you're referring to is normally about a tribunal brought by an employee who's been sacked by a company um, wanting to say that they've been unfairly sacked. And I know that um, I often speak with small business, and this is a, a real issue that small business have, which is that they find, you know, they don't... Um, they, they, they find that they've got rid of a worker that they didn't think was very good and then a few months later they're clobbered with a tribunal and they're st- staring down the barrel of being um, hit for £40,000 of a tribunal settlement and for a small business actually if being clobbered for £40,000 for sacking someone who happens to have won a case um, saying that they were unfairly dismissed um, it, you know that, that can absolutely destroy a small business and they were very won a case though because that would be a a judicial decision that mm. they were unfairly dismissed. So if you say it, it makes it sound as though you think that they that it's always the employers are always right and that people don't no, have no, the right no. to take employees. To no, I, I, I'm not saying that at all. I think um, I mean the, the government has tried to try to, to tighten up the, the regulations in this area, which is fair enough. Small businesses are not always, um, you know, keeping records of everything in a way which, uh, w- which they probably ought to. And the reality is I think the courts tend to find in favour of, um, you know, in favour of the employees um, quite often for, uh, you know, fairly spurious grounds. And I think that that was so something... So, Mark, are you need. saying this is actually a good change for small businesses? I think I think the changes the changes on tribunals were were a, a good change. I think they were. I think the balance had moved too far in favour of the in favour of the employers there. Yeah, I think. Mark, but the problem is that the people who need it the most 
are suffering. And I'll accept what you're saying in relation to tribunals. Mm. Yes, there were spurious uh, allegations made, um, but we haven't got a happy medium. Mm. The people now who need it the most, uh, I go on about it, the, the people suffering domestic violence, the people who mm. have injuries um, and can't get a lawyer, you know, these are the people that have to be looked after. Mm. We have a duty of care. If an employee feels that he has been mistreated and has been dismissed under the correct legislation, then he should be the one paying for the lawyer first. And if he wins his case, then it can be reimbursed to him under the claims. But the people who are missing out are the people at the bottom. I'd just like to draw in a line under this and point out that we had uh, one of the, I think he was a master of the Bristol Law Society or something, in on the programme in 2013. It was the first ever time in history where Bristol lawyers had actually gone on strike because of changes to the legal aid system, which was I was quite surprised at. Uh, anyway, on to talk about Freemasonry now, because over the last few years, this programme has exposed two prominent local politicians as Freemasons. Former Mayor of Western Super Mayor Philip Judd, who's now serving a 14-month jail sentence for possessing hundreds of pornographic images of films and films of children, and last Parliament's MP for Filton and Bradley Stoke, Jack Lepresti, both Conservatives. Should candidates, do you, uh, people think, declare their membership of secret societies like Freemasonry when standing for public office? Perhaps, Mark, you first. Um, I, uh, this is, it's an interesting topic. Um, should they declare it... Um, I, I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I mean, a business interest would be declared. Yeah, it? indeed. I mean, business, in, business interests are declared, and, uh, and quite thoroughly, in fact. And I think, actually, the law... I mean, even local politicians... I'm, a, I'm an elected councillor, and I have to declare anything that I'm involved with. Um, and I think that's, that's absolutely right, because we don't want people to get any impressions of um, impropriety or people pulling strings and, and getting uh, political decisions in order to benefit themselves. Um, I mean, I must admit, I, I, I don't really think that these, are, these old organisations like the Freemasons are really pulling strings behind the scenes anymore. I, I'm, I'm not really a believer in that. I, I mean, I've been in elected politics in Bristol for 20 years, and people say that Bristol is a hotbed of uh, Freemasonry, this and that, and I can't say... Uh, so people certainly do. Some people do. I've never seen any of it. I've never seen any, you know, any of that stuff going on. I mean, there is an organisation that you, you guys like to talk about, the Merchant Venturers. They're not a secret society. They're actually quite public. I mean, you can find out who's in what. They're, they're basically like a, bit, a business club of mates who, um, who lobby and back each other up at the right occasions. That's a bit annoying sometimes, but they're public. Everybody knows who they are. Everybody knows that they've got the same business interests and they all own property in the same places and that kind of stuff. Like I say, it's a bit annoying, but it is public. Public. I don't think there's anything, um, you know, uh, secret about it. Kerry, for Labour. Well, I, I do think transparency is important. So I think that the more, inf you know, the, to put information in the public domain, I suppose, as, as Mark says, it's in the past it's always been assumed that the only influence upon you would be if someone's paying for you to vote a, a certain way. I, I don't actually think that MPs should have outside interests or second jobs, yeah, outside financial interests as directorships or consultancies and Ed Miliband has said that he would ban that um, if Labour get elected so I think that's, that's one um, aspect but there are lots of other ways in which people could be influenced and I just I suppose what, what's at the bottom of it is I don't really know what Freemasons do these days and whether it is likely to be something that would influence them if there was evidence that there was you know an awful lot of shady dealing and discussions going on and strings being pulled then I think that ought to be in the public domain but well, I suspect that it's one of the a, things a that little bit in, well, okay, one yeah. of the things that is in the public domain is that it's quite clear that there was a Freemasonic network and maybe still is in the Metropolitan Police between um, mm. people who were uh, uh, sources at the News of the World mm. were getting information from public bodies through not those from Masonic being Masons now, the police? No, I thought they were. Not. No, no, they no, were. No. Right, okay. uh, anyway, uh, maybe Justin on this as well. I would point out as well that uh, around about 2005, for a couple of years, it was on the declaration of interest forms of all councillors and MPs for a couple of years that you had to put if you were a member of a secret society because that's where I saw Jack Lepresti. He'd put he put a little uh, note there saying, I'm a Freemason, but it's not a secret society, underlined twice. So for a while it was, uh, the Standards Board of England used to look at this kind of thing, and then the Standards Board of England was abolished. But anyway, Justin, what were your thoughts about secret societies? Um, wow, yeah. Um, I've never encountered a funny handshake, it's rather a shame. Um, the, 
obviously sort of like they are around and stuff. I'm not sure how massively significant they are. As you mentioned, the Merchant Ventures and stuff. One thing I did learn the other day was that and, uh, is GCHQ and the fact that they are uh, trying to employ loads and loads of people with autism. If you've got an autistic child then and they're, doing, they're going through school, GCHQ want to know. And it's really weird that they're starting to sort of, let's say, trying to tap in to people who are, let's say, not distracted by things and vague at maths and things like that. And that's something that uh, is really odd, the fact that, let's say, you know, the, the, uh, Freemasons are one thing, but GCHQ is another. There are secret societies and secret organisations, but uh, the MOD don't usually sort of seem to come under that bracket. I mean, the problem, from my, from my point of view, is looking at the oaths that the Masons swear, it's quite clear that their oath of loyalty is to their own organisation mm. some would call a religious cult rather than to the public which is why I question should, can they actually swear these oaths and then stand for public office anyway uh, Steve Wood what are your thoughts about the Masons is this something big or well not? here's a news flash I'm a Freemason there's my ring I've been a Freemason for 15 years. I'm extremely proud of the fact. And Freemasonry is the biggest donator next to the National Lottery. We donate to charity. We are not a secret society, and we are not a society with secrets. You can go onto the Internet, and you can find out anything you want to. We have a massive amount of money given to charity. In fact, the Freemason Hall in London was the first people who put their hand in their pocket when the tsunami hit the Philippines and we immediately sent across in excess of £5 million. Um, would you be happy for a little box on your declaration of I interest? I have no to, to problem say, saying I'm a Freemason. Uh, I have no problem with anybody who asks me. I'm extremely proud of the work we do with charity. We fund UK diabetes to the tune of around £2 million a year. We have masses amounts of members, some who are rich, some who are not. And we have others who give 20p, 30p a week, and some who give. But the thousands. bottom line is, should it be declared? Do you think or not? It's like up to a, everybody's like a, like individual a business interest. Would okay. Um, let's ask you a question. Do you are you a member of a golf club? And if you happen to want to declare it, would you? Yeah, well, I'm not a member of a golf club, but I don't swear um, Masonic oaths to join my golf club. That is uh, we don't, oaths of loyalty we, we, to my own organisation. The there are three main, well, four, if you want, main rules in Freemasonry. The first one, you must believe in a higher being. Whether it's God, Allah, Buddha, doesn't matter, but you must believe in a higher being. The second rule is that your family come first, then your work than Freemasonry. So whatever we do, our family and our work must come before Freemasonry. And we also swear an oath that we will not use our connections to get where we want to go. That might have been the case 100 years ago, but let me tell you, it certainly isn't the case now. And if I had to rely on Freemasonry to keep me in work, I would be Bankrupt. So do you think it should be declared or not? It's entirely up to anybody. It, you know, I don't declare... Well, I mean, when I declare my business interest, it says you must declare your business interest there. Well, if people want to declare it, if it's on a form, they have an option. It's called a human right. You know, if people want to say they're a mason, they have a right to say it. There are some people of old school who say that we shouldn't be saying it. I'm proud of the fact that I help people. I'm proud of the fact that I'm a Freemason. I'm proud of the fact that we're the second biggest donator next to the National Lottery to people who need it. Any more comments on that? And just when you say it's it's family work and Freemasonry, I still don't quite get what Freemasonry is, unless Freemasonry. it's just about the charitable <laughs> side. Is it like the Rotary Club? Yes, it is a charitable organisation. Um, it, it, there's a lot of symbolism involved in it, and it goes back three or four hundred years, if not longer. Um, but primarily, Freemasonry for the last two, three hundred years has been a charitable organisation. We have bursaries that we give to kids who can't afford to get to university. We fund them. We help people who need hospital treatment, who can't get hospital treatment because it's going to be too long. You know, and, and it's not just ingrowing toenails. We will pay for heart bypasses and things like that. We pay out millions and millions of pounds every year to people who need it. And you don't have to be a Freemason to get it. But is a, you have a noose around your neck. Did you have that when you were initiated? I can't tell you that because we are obliged not to say certain things. And a, and a, and a knife to your I chest? I can't tell you that either. Okay. I would actually rather heart, heart bypasses were paid for by the NHS, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the trouble is, Kerry, we know that the waiting lists are there. And if somebody can go private 
and that it can be done with the help of an organisation, and we never ask for the money back. We never ask okay, for the money on back. on to another subject now, surveillance. Edward Snowden's shown the internet and phone networks are being used by signals intelligence agencies. We heard about GCHQ just now, and also the National Security Agency in the United States, not just to spy on politicians. We had Angela Merkel's phone being hacked, uh, journalists and lawyers, but also for mass surveillance of us all. Many believe this strays into criminality because it bypasses due process of judges and the courts. So, I'll ask first Mark Wright for the Lib Dems. Is Snowden a hero or a traitor? He's a hero. He's, a, he's one of the biggest heroes of the last decade. I think. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I've mentioned I'm a scientist. I'm also a computer programmer. I've long been involved I- with um, issues about um, privacy and civil liberties. I've been campaigning against ID cards, for example, since about 2003. Finally, we we're very pleased to have scrapped them back in uh, 2010 when uh, the coalition government came in. Now, it, it's absolutely true to say that the secret services of Britain and America and a number of other countries are completely out of control at the moment. They're completely out of control. They've been given free reign partly because of the war on terror that we, uh, we, we touched on earlier, but also because um, new technologies um, uh, have been coming in faster than politicians have been able to understand them and are able to, to regulate the Secret Service's behaviour in them. Um, one of the things which has disappointed me greatly is that the British courts have looked at some of these intrusion cases, some of the things that Snowden raised, and have found in favour of the government on the most ridiculous uh, case, uh, cases, I think. You know, the, what's the, the, the Guardian journalists who were, you know, holed up and arrested and detained in Heathrow Airport, clearly a massive violation of a law which I already thought was heavy-handed and which I opposed, clearly not within the law, and yet somehow the judges were looking for spurious grounds on which to protect the government on this. I think the reality is um, the, the courts are not going to do the job for us. They're, they are not going to uphold these laws. For some reason, the judges in, in Britain and a number of countries have got a real blind spot when it comes to the behaviour of secret services. And so I think Snowden is needed. He was absolutely necessary to come forward and basically to, you know, to leak it. Um, it, because we, we cannot rely on, on the, the police and the courts, I think, in, in this specific area of, of, uh, of, of secret service behaviour. We cannot rely on them to stay within the law. Uh, is there any way to properly, um, I suppose, oversee the secret services in this way? I mean, because we've got the Intelligence and Security Committee, haven't we? Malcolm yeah, Lefkin yeah. actually I mean, I, had to resign as chair of that um, yeah, earlier this I, year. I, 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 I had a lot of respect uh, over the years for Malcolm Rifkin. I thought he was, he was one of a small number of Conservative MPs that I quite respected. But then when, he was, uh, when it was down to him to, and his committee to look into this, I think he f- was found wanting. He was really, really weak and limp on it, and, actually, and, that, and that destroyed a lot of his credibility, which is a shame. I think he should have realised, when he saw just how bad it was, that the writing was on the wall for that particular game that they were playing. And he should have, you know, he should have gone for them, but he wanted to... I think he wanted to, to stick with the establishment, and I, I was really disappointed about No, you're painting a picture of a security services out of control. How do you rein them back in? I think, I think probably we're going to need, like I said, because the, the courts are not going to enforce the laws that we have in place in the way that they were intended. So I think probably we need new laws. Um, I know Nick Clegg and the Lib, the Lib Dems have come forward. We've got some stuff in our manifesto about giving greater protection to whistleblowers um, and, and you know, getting their f- fingers a, a little bit deeper into the secret service. Services. I think we need, I mean, I'm disappointed there's not more support from the other two parties because the reality is, you know, it's a bit like Trident. If the big two on, on these issues of national security, if they agree, then frankly, it, nothing much is going to change. Steve Wood for the uh, UK Independence Party. What, what are your thoughts about Snowden? Is he a traitor or is he a hero? I think that, that Snowden and the Guardian are both traitors. We have uh, MI5 and MI6 for a reason and to protect us, and sometimes things have to be protected in secret um, and I personally believe if you've got nothing to hide you haven't got a problem uh, we have a mass amount of CCTV um, in the UK uh, at the present moment in time and it's growing we all have the opportunity to have CCTV outside our house I currently drive around with a dash cam so that to lower my insurance but there's a reason we have it because there are those out there who want to hurt us and Snowden put people's lives at risk. There are agents who are putting their life on the line 
every day working undercover, whether that be uh, in the UK um, to gather information from terrorists or whether it be overseas working to try and stop terrorists getting to this country. But do you think uh, that the security services at GCHQ, these people should be going to a court and getting a court order before they put someone on, on a surveillance? Because it's clear they're not doing that. Well, they're going for <laughs> mass trawls of millions of people's data all at once. If they want to read my emails, good luck to them. You know, that's all I'll say. They, so it doesn't bother you that it they're doesn't not bother going me. to the court? I would rather those people stand on a wall and when I go to bed at night, they protect me. And that's why I'm proud of our armed services and our military, whether they're civilian or not. We want to be protected. We have a right to be protected. We have a burglar alarm on our house for a reason. And our security services are our burglar alarm. We will always get rogue operatives. You will always get rogue police officers. You will always get a rogue army person or navy person, they have to weed those out quickly. Personally, I'd rather they stood on that wall than me. I wouldn't want to do it, but I'm grateful they do. Well, the US Jewish writer Edwin Black wrote a book, IBM and the Holocaust, and he was looking at the way that the Nazis used mass surveillance back in the 1930s and early 1940s, really abused it. They were using computers basically to select the people that they would... No different than the European Union in the fact that they have got mass surveillance on us already and it's trying to be increased. And what about um, conf confidential client... Uh, lawyer communications, for example. Well, yes, of course, they, they, they should be uh, held private unless it's a, a, a threat to our society. But we've, we've found from Snowden they're not private. i got to be honest, I haven't seen anything that... I haven't read the emails because I'm just not interested. But the people who protect us, in my humble opinion, should be protected from people like Snowden. OK, Justin Quinnell for the Green Party. Um... Yeah, well, I think it's not as if the um, Secret Services don't exactly self-police well. Um, but I'd like to go on to the sort of CCTV thing. I'm, I'm a pinhole photographer, and I put pinhole cameras around the place doing six-month exposures. And I thought I'd do one of the motorway junction where I live. And I just wandered along with a little step ladder and got my camera. And next thing you know, about three van loads of police sort of pile on top of you. Um, you know, the CCTV cameras are there because people don't police in a community way anymore. It's basically, oh, that's happened, right, we'll see if it's a serious one, if it goes above this grade, then we'll sort of, like, you know, check what's happened from that there, there onwards. Um, I... But, Justin, how many crimes have been detected because of CCTV? How, how many, how, how how many, many people ignored? have been stopped from committing a crime because of CCTV? Yeah, how many also have been ignored? I mean, I think there's a level at which, let's say, you want to be able to have uh, communities rather than just being watched the whole time. The old days with rose-tinted glasses where you had the old lady looking out of a window and would go out and say, don't do that. People are afraid to approach people because they don't know what they're going to get. No, I think people are not approaching people, interacting with people because they're making their front gardens into car parks, because people are driving at far more than a 20, 30 mile an hour zone, because basically people don't interact and we don't have communities anymore. We need to start re-establishing communities and, and communication within them. And we need our safety them. as well, and their safety. And personally, if that means that somebody sat in a room watching a CCTV camera, watching me walk down the road, well... I've got nothing to hide, and if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to worry about. OK, Kerry McCarthy for Labour. What's your thoughts on uh, surveillance and the revelations of Edward Snowden? Is he a traitor? Is he a hero? Well, I think, obviously, we do need to keep such things under um, scrutiny and to make sure that the... Uh, they're not being abused. And one of the things, I've been Shadow Human Rights Minister in the Foreign Office team for the last few years, and I had a very interesting meeting with a group called Privacy International a while ago about how, you know, obviously we, we hear lots about arms exports and not selling um, equipment that could be used either for external aggression or internal repression to, to sort of regimes that have a very bad human rights record. And their concerns were that increasingly we're starting to export surveillance equipment to these countries that are then being used in very, um, well, sort of ways that we certainly wouldn't find acceptable and to, to spy on people and to control the people within those countries. So I think there's, there's obviously something that we need to make sure is... is is kept under scrutiny. I have concern with, with CCTV. Actually, I mean, usually I find that 
communities in my constituency are more likely to come to me wanting CCTV than to be objecting to it. So I was at the, um, the mosque under the M32 flyover today talking to a gentleman who lives around May Park School, and they've got an ongoing issue, have for many years, with um, prostitution on the streets. And we have found that mobile CCTV cameras deter the curb crawlers and in some cases help the police arrest the curb crawlers. Uh, but that is an example where the community is totally on, on board. I, you know, slightly uncomfortable with the idea that you're being watched everywhere you go, but I think that, as um, uh, Steve said, it does sometimes pro um, well, provide a useful purpose. I can remember a survey from 2011 of CCTV that supposedly, anyway, proved that it didn't reduce crime at all, that there was actually no reduction in crime when CCTV went into an area. Well, I think you quite often see in court cases where, you know, where people have been assaulted, for example, you know, in, in murder cases where you can s actually put together, piece together the evidence of who has travelled from one place to another at a certain time of night. So I, th I think that's, you know, it definitely has been useful. Now on to the Metro bus, formerly known as Bus Rapid Transit. Construction of Bristol's £200 million Metro bus has started. Guided buses will run from Emerson's Green and another spur from Cribs and the new housing estates at Patchway down to Temple Meads and then down south round the Ashton Vale and Hengrove Loop. The Bristol scheme follows two other fraught UK guided bus experiments. In Cambridge, their busway suffered construction delays and has cost nearly three times what the council originally signed up for. Uh, then Luton and Dunstable busway attracted only a third of the promised passengers. Luton Council are refusing to pay a £3 million shortfall and costly, a costly legal battle with construction firm Bam Nuttall is looming. Uh, the council are also having to deal with hundreds of compensation claims as residents next to the busway say jarring vibrations are making home life unbearable. Across the channel, the French city of Caen scrapped their guided buses and replaced them with trams in 2011. Bristol Mayor George Ferguson has signed it off, but will Bristol's Metro bus experiment work? Well, Cambridge accountant Tim Phillips runs local public transport campaign Cast Iron, and he's worried that Bristol may be another costly guided bus experiment. It was the first of what the government at the time wanted to have as demonstration projects. Now, by definition, if you want to prove that something doesn't work, then you have to let those demonstration projects go through and say after, you know, after the end of the project, if you like the demonstration, hmm, yeah, well, it's a nice idea, but actually it hasn't worked. I have a horrible feeling that uh, Bristol is the third guinea pig after Cambridgeshire and the Luton Dunstable uh, guided busway, and I have a horrible feeling in the sense that we, the three of us have become sacrificial lambs, and I think we'll see the common sense at the end of the day and eventually somebody will say, well, we, give it, we gave it a go, but it didn't work. What we'll end up being left with, I don't know. It's a mess in Cambridgeshire. It really is a, a, an engineering mess, uh, which is a, a, a scar on the countryside and a, a bad legacy. How that will work out in Bristol, I really can't say. That's uh, Tim Phillips there from Cambridge, their cast iron campaign, which is a public transport campaign in the city. He's saying it's been uh, a bit of a disaster over there, an engineering disaster. Also, it's not attracting in some places as many passengers as we're being told. What are your thoughts about how this is going to develop over the next few years? Kerry McCarthy. Well, Galena. I used to be a councillor in Luton in the mid-1990s, and we'd already been talking about TransLink, as it's called, um, for a very long time then. And I have to say that I was never particularly convinced that it would be used. Um, it's partly because of demographics and so on and the people's travel to work areas and, and things like that. And I only realised the other day, my grandfather lives there, and I only realised the other day that it was now up and running, but I've been told by family members in the area that, yes, it's, it's not used and it's, it's mostly empty. My issue with Metrobus, well, you know, you, you'll know that I was very much opposed to its impact on East Bristol, and particularly on the Feed Bristol site and the Stapleton allotments. But when you actually... What, what worried me is over the course of the past two years, we held public meetings at Begbrook Community Centre where we got the consultants to come out and explain to us why they thought BRT was the answer to the public transport and the traffic problems in that neck of the woods. And I went from being having some questions but being broadly supportive of the idea something was being done about public transport to by the end being completely unconvinced because they just could not justify spending 200 million um, the rumors are that it's going to go 
well over budget anyway and particularly in terms of putting the bus only junction loop on the feed bristol site i think that's an absolute waste of money i think the bridge itself would um cost about 20 million and might knock three seconds off a, a bus journey i don't think it's going to be used i think um when they come up with passenger figures it looks like they've scribbled them on the back of a fag packet and actually they haven't taken into account the fact that they're taking people off of other buses to put them on that service so yeah i have the, the thing that disappoints me the most is that when george ferguson ran for mayor he said that he wanted to scrap brt then he got into power and said oh contractually i can't but he did go to the department for transport and talked about the ashton gate end of it and got them to significant i think it's a bit around the m shed got them to significantly alter the route I asked him to do the same for BRT3. He told me that he tried and they wouldn't let him change it. And then I went to the Department for Transport, sat down with the minister, and she said they'd had no requests or approaches whatsoever from the council. So I feel quite badly let down by George Ferguson on that. And I think it's because it's something that the impact, the negative impact, was being felt on East Bristol, and that's not a part of the city he ventures into very often. Well, George might say, well, that was BRT, Bus Rapid Transit. This is a new system, Metro Bus. Well... I think I think it's the same. Yeah, I think I think the problem is with these big ambitious public transport schemes. I, I mean, I've seen. I, I used to work for a transport consultancy for a time, and looking at the Leeds Super Tram project and doing some work for the other passenger transport authorities as well. And it's very difficult to keep them with, in budget. And I think what people mostly want in Bristol is they want a decent local railway line, um, so the, the Seven Beach line, as it w was known, and then. Um, they want the buses to be affordable and proper routes where you can actually get from A to B without going all around the houses. And I think to just invest in the basic bus services would be a good start rather than these, these rather grandiose schemes. OK, let's just set aside these worries um, from Luton and Dunstable where people are saying that they, they want to move out of their homes because their homes are shaking as these things go by Steve Wood for UK Independence Party but I mean one of the main potential dangers here is, is as we've heard um, um, from Luton as well is the, these cost overruns. Actually the same thing in Cambridge. But anyway what are your thoughts about whether this is going to be a good scheme for the city? Well I'm not a, an accountant or a, um, an engineer so I'm afraid I'm going to have to give that question a minute because even my wife does the accounts at home I get it all wrong so uh, I end up not paying bills and she deals with it um, I think the Metro bus scheme is going to open up South Bristol and as you rightly mentioned I'm standing in South Bristol I think South Bristol has been the poor relation of this city for far too long and I'm hoping that by opening up South Bristol we're going to get more investment over there we're going to create more jobs we're going to create more small businesses who in turn will hopefully employ local uh, people and again boost the economy um, yeah I'm really hopeful for the South but the bus link I really am I think there's a few issues that need dealing with um, but in the main, I'm, I'm positive for it. Well, we're all hopeful, but Justin Quinnell, do you think it's going to work, this metro bus? It's not going to relieve congestion to the extent. If you're going to carry on, I mean, one of the things that's a big problem is the lack of communication or lack of joined-up thinking between Bristol, South Gloucester and this sort of neighbouring areas. They're building a whole new town on Filton Airport and uh, they're all going to probably want to work in Bristol. Um, you know, well, you, they'll be able to hop on the metro bus, won't they? They'll be able to hop on. <laughs> a few of them will. I mean, I was on the very last train exciting stuff in 1963 I remember it well, I think I was one uh, from Portishead to Bristol and that line there is desperately needed you know, that would sort of relieve congestion quite considerably from Portishead and stuff the Metro bus, well, you know it's, it's going to be probably okay, a little bit okay, I think that it's you know, we need to look further afield, we need to look you know, far beyond just one uh, little track to be able to sort out our sort of uh, the congestion, our roads, and also the sort of pollution that happens from that. Um, you know, we are going to go the same way as Peking and everyone else. Um, the M32 is one big solid traffic jam in the mornings when I walk past it. But surely what you're saying is we should have this. It's going to be a great solution. We should have lots of solutions. This as one is as very small. It's £200 million, and it's not really going to... I mean, one of the things also is, yeah, it got the Feed Bristol thing. I went up there and I took my kids to the protesters and stuff and we sat amongst them and things I even gave them a few hot water bottles and stuff I mean it's not a big deal but uh, you know it was a, a massively inspiring having non-violent direct action on your doorstep and also the importance of food and food manufacture local food growing versus let's say you know um, 
<laughs> building, let's say. Uh, but what Tim Phillips um, from Cambridge was saying there, Mark Wright, effectively, was that you are the third guinea pig in line. Um, I think it's, it's true that we're not very good at infrastructure in this country, and we haven't been for over a generation. I mean, it's probably nearer two generations since we really beat, built some decent infrastructure it's in this country. It's worrying that the French city has g- given this up in, in 2011 um, and gone over to using trams instead. Well, I mean, it's also worth pointing out, incidentally, that, you know, just, just, because, it, just because it's, it, it's not trams isn't, isn't really what the problem is. I mean, the tram scheme in Edinburgh has just gone hundreds of millions of pounds over budget, incidentally, you know, and the problems with Crossrail is bill- billions of pounds over budget, and those are, you know, those are rail projects. I think it's, it's more a problem with the fact that we are unable to do uh, infrastructure in general. I mean, I, I think the, the Luton-Cambridge um, uh, problems are... I, I, I don't think they're necessarily applicable here because they're, they're largely rural schemes that connect towns um, and, uh, and villages and with, with, large amounts of guided, with large amounts of guided tramway, whereas the Bristol scheme, one of the things which has happened as a result of um, you know, the budget shavings on them is that there's now hardly any guided busway actually in these, these bus schemes. They're largely actually just sort of super-duper bus lanes. Um, and I think there's a lot less scope to actually get those wrong because, I mean, we, we've actually had quite good results with the previous round of, uh, of bus lane improvements we've had in Bristol. But I would, I would agree with Steve. All three of the Metrobus routes go through South Bristol, and actually that's, that's quite a good thing for, for South Bristol. Transport is an absolute nightmare in South Bristol. Unlike, you know, I mean, North Bristol, East Bristol, you've got the Ring Road, you've got the motorways, you've got the A4, you've got fantastic connections to everywhere. South Bristol has got pretty much terrible connections to everywhere, and it really, really desperately needs So is, is Metrobus routes. the right scheme? Is it going to work? Well, it's, it, it's, it's the only scheme that was on offer, so whether it's the right scheme or not is irrelevant. It was literally the only scheme that was on offer. I think it will help. It's not going to, I'll be perfectly honest, it's not going to cut congestion because Bristol is growing so fast that all it's going to do is it's going to slow the rate of growth of congestion a bit. But the, the city is growing so fast that the congestion is going to still be getting worse. If I can come in on a few points. Um, first of all, the Luton Dunstable one is, is definitely not in a rural area. It's one big conurbation and there's, mm. it's Cambridge not a very is. green place at all, I can say that, yeah, having, having been born out. there. But, um, but you did say Luton as well. Um, in terms, and I also think that people in East Bristol would disagree with Mark that transport is good there. I think transport is bad virtually everywhere. You go in this, this, the city, well, I travel around East Bristol quite a lot and it's, it's not good at all. If you look at, say, the M32, for example, coming into town. And I think one of the solutions is, and this goes back to, I think, what Justin was saying about working with other neighbouring local authorities, we desperately need more park and rides, and particularly a park and ride on the M32. That's difficult to do when we're having to fight the other three local authorities who don't want it on their land. due to the Cabot Circus? Most of the traffic, the the, the queues that are built up on the M32 seem to be due to that being built. It's it's partly down. There weren't so much, anywhere near as many queues before it was built, anyway. I think think it's partly down to that, but that doesn't negate the the need for a park and ride further down there. And, you know, I've always, it's, it's bizarre that every other big city has a passenger transport executive type structure where they can work together and perhaps put aside the, the daily party politics and that to improve transport and that Bristol doesn't have one in the West of England partnership. I so I think that's important. The here because, mm. you know, all of us, we've mentioned one word, congestion. Mm. And it's interesting to note that the mayor of Liverpool actually did away with the bus lanes and he improved the flow of traffic by nearly 25%. But not of buses, obviously. Anyway, uh, on to another subject. You're not going to get much on the mainstream press because there's not been a lot of discussion about this big uh, subject uh, on the mainstream media, and it's child sexual abuse. Um, We heard uh, in March this year that uh, a watchdog is to investigate the Metropolitan Police over cover-up claims, and I just want to run through one or two of those claims. Uh, Allegations that documents are found at an address of a paedophile that originated from the Houses of Parliament, listing a number of highly prominent individuals individuals, MPs and senior police officers as being involved in a paedophile ring and no further action was taken. An allegation that an account provided by an abuse victim had been altered to omit the name of a senior politician. Allegation that an investigation into a paedophile ring in which a number of people were convicted did not take action in relation to other more prominent individuals. 
Again, an allegation that the surveillance operation of a child abuse ring was shut down due to high-profile people being involved. And finally, an allegation that police officers sexually abused a boy and carried out surveillance on him. Uh, Justin Quinnell, what are your thoughts about what's happened over the last year since we heard uh, the uh, um, two inquiries were set up last summer? Very little seems to have happened. In fact, some might say it's been kicked into the long grass to make sure it wasn't playing a part in this general election campaign. Yeah, very true. Um, so I've forgotten the guy's name who died recently. Who Leon Britton. Leon possibly. Britton. Now, my mum, who isn't around anymore, um, <laughs> she basically told me about Leon Britton. So people knew about him. And, like, my mum's, you know, she's lived them or whatever. But, like, you know, there are certain, you know, people knew things like that were happening and are happening. And, you know, it's been hideous, whether it be through... And you can pick any organisation, and it's been covered up. Um, well, to be fair, Norman Tebbit, in fact, last summer, also said something along similar lines. He said, back in those days, we just used to cover these things up. Yeah. Um, yes. And I think that has been the case. And, like, you can look in loads of organisations, and I'm not going to start picking them and things like that, but, like, it was something that was, like, you know, just swept under the carpet. It was, it's hideous. So does the Green so, Party yeah. have a policy to deal with this? Um, I don't know. It's something I haven't sort of, like, gemmed up on. One thing I have got is, like, you know, I've got bits and pieces of domestic violence and women and stuff like that. But the, you know, the child abuse sides of stuff, I don't know. I think that, like, it's something that, like, thank heavens people are looking into it as much as they, you know, uh, to the extent they can, but they must look into it far more. And I think the cover-ups are happening. They are happening. And you, we mentioned Freemasonry earlier, and I don't want to drag that into it, but let's say being secret societies of some sorts or secret groups of organisations, you know, groups of people keeping things quiet. And I'm not mentioning that, let's say, directly with the Freemasons, but it just a group happen. of people. Not in Freemasonry. No, I'm not saying it would, but let's say, you know, let's say, OK, the church or, let's say, um, whatever organisations you want to look at who have, let's say, had sort of you know things accused from them in the past and stuff like that, um, you know, people will keep it quiet. The police or whatever. So Steve, you say it wouldn't happen, but I mean, it's happened in Buckingham it, Palace. It's, it's happened, Allegedly, it's, it's happened. happened in many places. I uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts about this? Because it seems to be we're coming back to another thing we mentioned earlier, which is this business of too big to jail. Yeah. And I wonder what your, and your I thoughts go back, as UKIP are about what should be done about and this. And I go back to if you do the crime. You must be prepared to do the time. Um, let's go to Jenna at the moment. The, the, the CPS have turned around and said he's too ill to prosecute. Now You're talking so, about Greville Jenna, yeah, the Labour peer, I yeah. believe. Now, yeah. I, I am going to mention two Labour uh, people, Kerry, and it's not personal. It's the only two I can recall at the moment. Um, but two Labour Party people have recently been uh, charged, and they weren't going to get charged because they were suffering for dementia. Now, I'm not a doctor, so I can't clarify anything. However, one lady made a mar mar miraculous recovery after she was not going to be charged for expenses fraud. Um, I'm not saying that's the case with Jenna, but I am saying that I don't care who you are. If you do the crime, I don't care how high you are, you do the time. Now, we have to get a way to open up those files. The Savile case, uh, Buckingham Palace, uh, politicians, policemen, I don't care who you are. And, and child abuse the most. It's the most foul crime one can ever think of. I don't know if our, our panel here have got children. I have children and I have grandchildren. And I will do time if anybody oh, hurt what, them. What about the, uh, this uh, allegation that's come along with a lot of this, that this was being used for political blackmail? D there's a possibility it could be. I'm not saying anything. I mean, we, we're going back f in places 50, 60 years when it was a completely different world. I'm not justifying that. I'm just saying it was a different world. I've often asked this question. In today's society, we hear so much about child abuse we hear so much about what's going on. Was it the same 60, 70 years ago, but we didn't have the open media sources and it was just brushed under the carpet? Mark, right. A lot of this mm. uh, started the um, latest sort of spate of this because it was going in the, in the 1980s and in the 1990s mm. with the Jimmy Savile case. And actually, the reporter for the BBC that was um, part of that, Liz McKean, um, she was told by her editor at Newsnight at the BBC, she was told, well, I'm sorry, we've got a Jimmy Savile special coming up at Christmas. Mm. I'm afraid we won't be airing your piece. So, you know, this is, it's actually, there is obviously some quite of, 
um, pressure to keep this out of the public domain. What, what would the Lib Dems do? Uh, what's your policy mm. towards dealing with this problem? I mean, obviously, this is this has been very shocking. I think to, to almost everyone. Um, there is a there is a wide ranging public inquiry now that's been set up and is going to look at a lot of these things. Uh, I mean, it's it's been delayed uh, quite a long time, unfortunately, because they couldn't agree on who was going to chair it. They well, it's the third person. Well, yeah, they finally exactly, found yeah. somebody that I mean, might it, do it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a shame. But I think you know part of the problem was that they were saying that the the, the 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 previous chairs had connections which might prejudice the way they were thinking. And if if what we're talking about is cracking open, you know, the secrecy, then maybe it was right that they kept on trying again until they found someone who they were really convinced had absolutely no links to any of them, by, whether it's by friendships or business but or well, whatever. But why was, why was um, somebody appointed to be, originally, you know, who's connected to Leon Britton? I yeah, yeah, yeah in, 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 indeed. It has to be somebody from politics that is on a panel looking at this. Why don't we bring in a detective, a high-ranking, yeah, profile it's not, it's detective? Judge. Yeah, indeed. The, the, the person they finally yeah, but settled judge on is not a... Yeah, judge uh, doesn't have an investigative mind, Kerry. A policeman, well. a, a high-ranking policeman or a, a, a very senior detective will be able to take this to pieces. OK, Kerry no, McCarthy. Well, it's, it's not a police investigation at the moment. It's a public inquiry and they're usually you know the call from the victims was for a judge-led inquiry um one of the things as, as you know i was in parliament sort of challenging theresa may on the composition of the inquiry and trying to push her to bring it forward and victims were certainly getting in touch with all mps but i think what's important is that they are represented and their voices are heard and yvette cooper very much took that up in challenging the appointment of the, the two previous chairs because but if you talk they to, didn't have the confidence yeah. of the victims and surely the confidence of the victims... I mean, there's a very strong what, the last sense. thing we want is a whitewash and I, another yeah, cover-up. Can I just say, there's a very strong sense from the survivors that this has been kicked into the long grass, that it's yeah. not being dealt with where it should be being dealt with. Yeah, well, I mean, that is one of the, the issues that we sort of felt, you know, with some of the discussions about the documents that couldn't be revealed and Tom Watson has done a lot of work on this um, John Mann, another Labour MP, has been doing a lot of work on this, Simon Danchuk as well, trying to get them to reveal everything as, as quickly as possible so that we could, not necessarily in the public domain, but reveal that information to the inquiry so we know that you know, what was said and why weren't prosecutions brought. So it's frustrating. What we don't want, I mean, if you look at other inquiries, you know, the Bloody Sunday inquiry went on for decades. Well, the there Hillsborough, were several of them, that there? Hillsborough took 20 years and to find justice and still going on. So what's your we don't want for how long to that. this is going to take to get to the bottom of it? Well, I mean, and this is the, the, one of the frustrations of the victims is, as we know, quite a few of the perpetrators are quite elderly. We've read Liam Britton, an alleged perpetrator, has already died. Greville Janner is said to have advanced dementia. Um, who's another Cyril alleged... Smith well, Cyril Smith, Smith died. And they want the people brought to justice, which means criminal justice. But you don't want to rush the inquiry. And one of the things we were asked asking Theresa May was, could criminal cases be bought before the inquiry concludes? You don't want it to get so bogged down in looking at every single aspect of it that no one's prosecuted. So hopefully, the, and it, it is difficult, though, because you don't want to prejudice the inquiry by having prosecutions going on. But I, th I think it is important from the victim's point of view that if perpetrators are identified, that those files are put in front of the police as soon as possible so at least some people are held to justice. Are we giving the victims the support they need as well? Well, that, that was something else that has been asked on, on many occasions because so. talk, even talking about their experiences <coughs> now is obviously new trauma for yeah. them, and, yeah, I think it's important that they... There's a massive oh. amount of admiration when you get the victims coming on and actually sort of, like, you know, standing up and saying, right, you know... This yeah. is uh, this is me. This is how I am now and stuff. And like you know, yeah. I just full admiration because it is something that like relies upon people's yeah. fear and to I keep think David it quiet. Cameron was very, I can't remember the phrase, but he was very dismissive of them. He almost well, I don't he want was actually to using misquote him. But conspiracy theories actually he used that expression yeah. to describe some of. Them. But no. but I mean, this isn't the only case like this. We had a true scandal in Belgium mm. uh, to do with uh, some Belgian politicians connected with that. We've also had the Franklin scandal in the United States as well. So I wonder if uh, it's just like. The Children's yes, issue there, yeah, that was, yeah. It looks yeah. connected with Savile too. There's also yeah. gang grooming and sexual abuse going on in a lot of our provincial towns yeah. and cities as well. I mean, this and, and that's going on in this day and age. I mean, a lot of these political things appear to have happened in the 80s and 90s and a long time before, but there is still. You know, widespread abuse of children going on in the country, unfortunately. I'd just like to draw a line under that and go round very quickly and ask you all about our final subject, which is housing and evictions. Uh, everybody's talking about building social housing, but nobody's doing it. I'm going to give you a half a minute each uh, on 
what's, what to do about it. Bearing in mind that evictions have nearly doubled since 2010. So, Steve Wood, for you, Kip. Uh, if, yeah, evictions have actually doubled partly because of the bedroom tax. Um, it's people who have to um, pay that now or not pay it. They're in a, a no-win situation. They don't want to move. They want to, to remain in their homes that they may have been there 30, 40 years, but they're being penalised. And because they're being penalised, they're getting, arrears in, uh, getting into arrears with their rent. And the councils are, are taking them to court, and they're getting eviction notices. And then the, they're coming along to the council and they're saying, well, I'm homeless. And the councillor is saying, well, you made yourself homeless, so it has to stop. We have to get rid of the bedroom tax. OK, Justin Quinnell for the Green Party. Um, yeah, cap rent. I remember fair rent tax and stuff where actually sort of like it was limited. I think there's a massive problem where people are treating what should be a human right as in somewhere to live as an asset, as something to make money from. And once you have that sort of embedded in the whole economy of the country, you're not going to get out of it. Um, it's, it's a hideous thing. And like building loads of homes, fine. Yeah, we need to. But also we need to build you know, homes which are sort of like sustainable in some way. There's a thing today about... Um, uh, well, basically putting solar panels and the rest on. OK, uh, Mark Wright for the Liberal Democrats. Everyone's talking about building yeah, social yeah. housing, there's, but there's, no one's doing There's it. actually quite a, a reasonable amount of housing being built at the moment, but almost none of it is social housing. And the reason for that is because the law was changed in 2011 to make it easier for de the developers to get out of their social housing requirements. That was done at the time to try and make it easier to build houses to stimulate the economy. Maybe it was a good idea at the time. It's no longer necessary. That law needs to be changed to make it impossible for developers to get out of their social housing requirements. OK, Kerry McCarthy for Labour, finally. Yeah, well, Labour has, has put a, a big emphasis on housing in its manifesto and affordable housing too and it's talked about changing the financing of council housing but one thing we said 11 million people live in private sector accommodation and that is very insecure we've said that we want starter tenancies of three years and a cap on rent rises above inflation during that period to at least give those people who have to live in a private sector rented uh, accommodation some stability okay that was kerry mccarthy thanks very much to our guests labor's kerry mccarthy you just heard their lib dems mark wright green party's justin quinnell and chairman chairman of bristol ukip steve wood conservative party have not put anyone forward for tonight's discussion alongside conservative labor lib dem green and ukip bristol has the former merchant venturer mayor george ferguson who's up for election next year uh, as well as several independents for bristol candidates in next week's ballot as well as trade union and socialist coalition left unity english democrats british national party and vapors in power some are standing in the bcfm area but outside the bristol city boundary next thursday on election night bcfm will be running an election special through the night our sister show dialects on mondays at 11 a.m this week the full interview with cambridge public transport campaign cast iron and also hear what their experience has been of the bus rapid transit system and a woman who spent £30,000 on IVF treatment then conceived naturally just by chilling out. You can listen again or download what you've just heard at thisweekoneword.co.uk. I'm Tony Gosling, wishing you a relaxing and enjoyable weekend. See you next week, where Martin Summers will be back to pour over the election results. Until then... <laughs>